Hey guys, Stagaholics. Thank you guys for being here today. I wanted to talk a little bit about this topic today, and that is how I think about shipping investing. I do want to finish the bulker video that I started last time. My goal is to finish that uh, sometime this weekend. But I wanted to talk a little bit about this, something I was thinking about um, a lot today. Um, how I've thought about investing and shipping investing hasn't always been what it is in this video. And I'm sure that it's not going to uh, be uh, parallel to a lot of the ways that maybe a lot of you guys see um, shipping investing. So uh, I love to hear criticisms. If you think my ideas are horrible, <laughs> by all means, let me know. If you see it in a different way, or if there's anything you want to share in the comments, I like to I like to read those. But I wanted to talk about I guess three main things um, in this video today, and the first is that I don't really see shipping at all as an investment. I see it more as a speculation and almost as a gambling speculation. But I do believe that there are edges in this gambling game. I wanted to talk a little bit about that. I wanted to talk about, since I do see it as kind of a, a game, a gambling game, I wanted to talk about sizing and bet allocations into shipping. Something that I get kind of cr cringy when I see it and people getting, in my view, very large <laughs> sizes in their investment uh, relative to their portfolio it makes me nervous when i see those kinds of things and i see it a lot <laughs> and the third thing i wanted to talk about are i guess three assumptions that i have about shipping and um, how those should inevitably lead to periods where shipping does very well and periods when shipping does very poorly I wanted to start by saying this, and hopefully this doesn't upset too many people, but that is this, and this is what I believe, and that is that shipping is a terrible business. It is largely a no-moat business. There's not a lot that differentiates any shipping company out there, despite what any of those guys might say. They are just tin cans that are placed on the ocean, where a crew's hired from a remote country as cheaply as possible. They go and pilot that that uh, that vessel. They take it from point A to point B, and they deliver a bunch of goods. Regardless of the segment, that's basically what it is. It's just a uh, fancy seaborne taxi business, right? But um, what makes shipping really interesting, at least as an investor, is that it's kind of like a match, right? A match has a lot of potential energy, although um, for most of a match's life, it'll sit there. It's kind of a dud. But there are brief periods when for example, when you light that match, it is going to burn and it'll burn very hot. Um, that's kind of like shipping, like you can see the container ship segment right now, they're on absolute fire, right? But as that match continues to burn, the, <laughs> the way of the cyclicality, the way of the business, eventually that match goes out and all of that, <laughs> all of that upside eventually turns into um, tremendous downside, right? Shipping, what I notice is a lot of people get involved when the match is on fire. What I see as successful, uh, or at least a successful, more successful strategy is to get involved in the space while the match is still there and it hasn't been lit, when there's the most potential energy in a segment. Occasionally in the comments, I'll get a comment that'll ask, hey, uh, is there a book that you would recommend that I read? You seem like you might know something or a thing or two about shipping. <laughs> Thank you. But if there was a book that I recommend, it would be this one. And it's by uh, Martin Stopford. It's actually a textbook and it talks about maritime economics. I think this book is is really good because it talks a lot about cycles and it talks about shipping in ways that I see that the, a lot of not a lot of other books talk about. Um, some of it can be pretty dry. Some of it, I think, is really interesting. Um, so if there's a book, it would be that I recommend. It would be this one. I wanted to read a excerpt from this book. First of all, I have an, a background talking a little bit about poker. So when I read this, it really it really stuck out to me. I um, lived um, modestly <laughs> playing poker for a little while. Uh, There's like a six or so month stint when, especially when I was in college, where I was playing the game, playing my uh, paying my rent, and doing it. It's highly stressful. Wouldn't recommend doing it but I did and it did shape a lot of the way I see a lot of different things and it is one of the lenses that I think about how I see shipping 
And uh, I wanted to read this, uh, this passage. The challenge of successful risk management. By the way, I see a lot of people who, in my view, who get involved in the shipping space, who do not have a, in my view, <laughs> a very um, good, successful risk management. Um, their position sizes, how much their money, uh, when they're investing in this space, all wrong, in my view. Uh, some people in you guys may not be one of those people who I see a lot of people doing this. What I notice is a lot of people who get interested in shipping get involved near cyclical peaks. They get involved because there's a lot of money being made at the time. And I also notice that they put portions of their portfolio that tend to be uh, too large. So that's what I mean by that. But I wanted to read this. So where does this leave us in terms of predicting freight cycles? And ultimately, as uh, shipping investors, that's what we'd want to do. We'd like to get in at a trough, like to get out near a peak, right? There are three conclusions to be drawn. First, in shipping cycles, as in poker, for every winner, there must be a loser. And um, that has a lot to do with the anemic earnings that shipping makes throughout its cycle. So there's going to be some people who makes a lot of money. There's going to be a lot of people who lose a lot of money, right? This aspect of the business is about risk management, not carrying the cargo. Shipping is not quite a zero-sum game, but we will see in Chapter 8, if you decide to read this book, that the financial returns average out at a fairly modest level. Second, shipping cycles are not random. This is part of some of my assumptions. The economic and political forces which drive them, although highly complex, can be analyzed. And if we can get some of those right, hopefully we can improve our edge over some of our opponents in the game. The economic and political forces which drive them, although highly complex, can be analyzed and the information used to improve the odds in the player's favor. But remember that if everyone has the same idea, it will not work. Last year, I made an observation and uh, I made a few videos about it in the tanker space where I decided to sell my tanker positions. I, uh, after the, um, the uh, vaccines were, were introduced, there was a lot of optimism in the space. Um, I was up, I don't know, 50% on one of my companies and up uh, 70%, or it was a little bit less, 30 and 70 or so on two of my positions. One was a little bit more um, speculative than the other, although they were both speculative. <laughs> um, the reason I decided to sell is because uh, there was what I perceived as a lot of optimism in the space. People were assuming that because vaccines were out, that um, the space was going to start to do a lot better. It was an unpopular opinion at the time. I did it anyway because um, the, the, the actual, the fundamentals in the tanker space did not change. So it was a time for me to take profits. Since then, I've purchased back in and I was, I'm basically have uh, what I call a free roll. You know, I'm, it's pretty hard for me to lose on that investment that I had made prior, right? The economic and political force, uh, where was we? Third like, poke, uh, third, like poker, each player must assess his opponents, take a view on how they will play the game, and work out who will be the loser this time. In the end, no loser means no winner. We should not be surprised that this makes shipping sound more like a gambling game than a sober transport business. But, and in my view how I see it, it is a gambling game. Shippers turn to the shipping market because they do not know how much shipping capacity they will need in the future. Nobody does. The, ship of the, sh the job of the ship owner is to make the best estimate he can and take a gamble, and hopefully a positive ROI one. If he is wrong, he loses. These decisions are complex and often require decisive action which flies in the face of the market. This is why individuals are often more successful than large companies. Imagine playing poker under the direction of a board of directors. Directors, For ship owners with many years in the business, the instincts that drives their decision probably derives from the experience of past cycles, reinforced by an understanding of the international economy and up-to-date information obtained from the international grapevine. And although this is uh, coming from the lens of a uh, shipping insider, I think we can think about this in the same way as an shipping investor. For those without a lifetime of experience, either newcomers to the industry or outsiders, the problems of decision making are daunting. Many bad decisions have been made because of a misunderstanding of the market mechanism. Now, in my view, although shipping might be a gambling game, I don't think that it's a gambling game that cannot be beaten. 
Um, for as much as I talk about shipping, I do not invest more than 10 to 15% of my portfolio in it. I liken this to a bankroll limit. Some of the most successful poker players of all time have gone broke. Some of them have gone broke several times. One of the major patterns or one of the major reasons they do that is because they just put too much money into any one buy-in. Say if they're a tournament player you know, and they have a million dollars, they've been very successful, they're Phil Ivey or whoever, and they, they buy into a tournament. Let's say that that tournament is a million dollar tournament. Right? Well, you better be damn sure you're going to win that thing because if you don't, you're broke. And I think that's a lot of what I see in um, tankers. Even this, even these sizings for I think a lot of people is just too much. Uh, a lot of people when they lose a, a significant portion of this a percentage of their portfolio, it's going to make them feel pretty, pretty damn lousy. For myself, the volatility, the variance, it doesn't bother me much. I can handle when some of my portfolio goes down a significant portion. And that's because I have the, um, the belief, at least, <laughs> the strong belief, that in the long run, um, I'm going to be profitable. So for every period that there is a, a period of downturn, there's going to be a periods of tremendous upside. The upside uh, significantly outweighing the downside. And I'd liken this to a tournament poker player. So this is what a successful tournament poker player's winnings chart would look like. They, uh, you, you'll see this pattern a lot if you analyze a lot of successful um, tournament poker players. So they'll go in very long periods where they do not make a lot of money. And remember, shipping that uh, goes through very long periods of droughts, right? And during those droughts, because share prices are a function of earnings, they, they tend to go down. And if you're involved too early, you're going to lose money. But remember, it's like a, a match. As these things, as that investment tends to go down, if you're not too early in a cycle, that match can get lit. And you can earn a tremendous amount of money over a very short period of time. Think about containers over the last year if you were involved in the space. And this is what a pattern that you see in a lot of um, tournament players. They'll hit a really big score and then, you know, they have an edge on the market. But it takes a really long time for that edge to be played out. And it's played out in very short bursts. In my view, I think that this would be what a very successful long-term long only uh, shipping investor would look like. I know that there are some different strategies in the place. I know um, there's uh, some hedge fund managers that do like long short spreads and they capture and it might be a lot smoother, although the uh, gains could be um, a lot more predictable. I'd imagine they would be a little bit smaller compared to successful <laughs> long term, long only shipping investing. But you have to remember it's a really highly complex game and the the variables that are out there in the world they change over time too so it takes it takes a lot um, but it is my belief that the longer you're involved in the game if you continue to think about it you continue to improve your game i think the chances that uh, an investor will be profitable and their graph if if you decided to so graph your shipping only investments would probably look something like this I wanted to lastly share three assumptions that I have about shipping investing. And um, they're very basic ones. These aren't the only things, the only things I think about in terms of whether I'm going to invest or whether I'm not going to invest. But these are the three underlying assumptions that I have about shipping investing that makes it possible <laughs> to play this game. And this is the first assumption. The first is that demand for seaborne goods always increases over time. So this is a chart of various things being transported by sea and you'll notice the ton miles of all of these goods in different segments goes up over time by the way one of the comments i get a ton because i talk so much about tankers and it, it, i'm not gonna lie i get triggered by it that is that uh, well oil has peaked you know though the demand for oil is going to go down i don't share that view um, i do share the view that at some point in the future we are going to reach peak human civilization and the demand for all of these goods will at some point peak. But I know it's my view that we are nowhere near that or for any of these things on this list and any of the other goods that are going to be transported by sea. Now, the second assumption is that the supply growth waxes and wanes based on earnings. 
So this here we're looking at is a chart, I guess, of different oil tankers. And this is the order book of said oil tankers at any given time. This is also paired with the global oil demand. I guess this is going from 2008 to approximately 2016. Ships have useful lives. At a certain point, they are no longer useful. And as they get older, they tend to get more expensive to operate. Um, well, we'll just leave it that for this. There's another thing I want to say about that, though. But um, when there are, when these ships go through periods of tremendous earnings, the order book gets filled up, right? Remember, this is largely a zero-sum game. Lots of people want to get involved, and then there's periods when, you know, nobody's making a tremendous amount of money. So, in th this chart, we can see that the amount of deadweight tonnage, the supply of vessels compare it from a good period to a down period is going to change. So if we assume, number one, that demand for goods is always going up, and we assume that the supply of ships waxes and wanes, then that means that there's going to be periods, if we get it right, based on the variables, that there are going to be periods when we can make some money, and then there's going to be periods, if we get it wrong, that we are going to lose money. Last assumption I have about this wonderful game of shipping is that the past repeats. Here is an example of one of those things that uh, we might be seeing now. Um, over here is the a series of events that took place in the past. So it started, I guess, in 1989. There's a ship called the XN Valdez tanker. And what happened with this ship? There was a single hulled oil tanker. It had spilled a bunch of oil, crashed into something, oil went ever everywhere, huge ecological disaster. Everybody was pissed off. <laughs> nobody, would, nobody liked that. So in 1990, the U.S. Congress passed the Oil Pollution Act requiring double hulls on new vessels. Now, you can't just say, okay, everybody has to use a double hull now. There's a period of time. It takes time to go and build all of these double hulled ships. But what this ended up happening, what this led to, as the bear market went into oil tankers, it put more pressure on these vessels to get scrapped because a lot of these owners knew, hey, these vessels are going to be illegal at some point in the future. There were people like Exxon who were like, you know, I'm not even going to hire any of these vessels. If there's, we're in a bear market and I can hire a double hull vessel, why on earth would I hire a single hull vessel and risk another one of those Exxon Valdezes? So these things got phased out super, super fast. Um, now, there's a lot of debate. Uh, People, I I actually view this in different ways than a lot of other people do, but we are also there's recently these IMO regulations and it's f talking a lot about emissions. So while before it was uh, focusing on an ecological disaster, now the focus is on I don't know a green revolution, right? But the net effect is very similar. So in this case, because there's all these stringent regulations coming in the, in the pipeline in the future, it tends to make these older vessels, kind of like the single hull vessels, more obsolete. In bear markets, it adds additional pressures on these vessels. For example, you have the HSFO and LSFO spread. Very old vessels do not tend to invest in this kind of green technology and they have to burn more expensive fuel. If you're in a bear market, that makes it more expensive for your ship to operate. On top of that, if your ship is older, it is more expensive to operate in general. <laughs> it's less efficient. So uh, because of all this, in bear markets, it adds additional pressure. Now, there's a lot of other things that people say, well, people have to go slower and things like that. And uh, there is some evidence to suggest that might be true. If you look at bulkers, for example, right now, they um, haven't really been speeding up. Now, it could be just because fuel costs are so expensive right now. Maybe they're really not speeding up. The, the incentives for um, the them to go much faster uh, isn't there because as they go much faster the cost of that fuel goes up uh, exponentially could be true could not be true but i know some of these things are true at least in my view so in my view this is an event that likely led to a period of time where ships earned a tremendous amount of time of uh, money and in my view this is another thing that looks very similar that could potentially lead to a very similar outcome in the future. Well, if you found this video useful, please consider liking this video. Um, if you would like to 
have any questions or you have, would like to add something in the comments below, let me know. If you hated it, I know that YouTube recently deleted the, the uh, dislike button. <laughs> let me know what you didn't like about it. Um, I'm open to criticism. If I'm just like a poker player, if I'm going to be a long-term successful shipping investor, in my view, I need to be as good at the, good at the game as possible. So if you think there's something I missed, uh, let me know. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll see you guys soon.